So welcome, Sari Lehtonen. So today's topic, uh, I'm honored to begin this lecture series. And I will talk about the evolution of educational buildings in Finland. Not so, so much of the history from way, way back. Well, I will take a look at like from last 50 years, how the, how the school buildings have evolved and along other educational buildings as well. I'm an architect and um, I started doing my doctoral uh, studies while I was working here as a lecturer for Pirio. And uh, we kind of thought this about the subject and it, it felt really logical to start studying educational buildings because I was working in an educational building. And I have some experience also in designing school buildings. And um, at some point, I noticed that there's a, a place in educational division that I could have uh, as an architect. So I applied it for it and, and got the job. And it, it has been really suitable for me, along with my studies. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the concept of learning environment, because as architects, we, we of course, assume that this is it, but uh, learning environment is much more. There are, of course, many ways to look at it, but I think this is uh, quite clear, clear concept to me for understanding what kind of elements there are. Uh, there are situational elements as like, we don't need actually a building to learn. We can learn in nature or in urban spaces in city. So the learning can actually happen anywhere. Uh, then there's this technical point of it. The information and communication techniques evolve all the time as you can see that we mess with them all the time, but actually the learning can happen quite virtually nowadays. So you don't need, need uh, buildings for it. So the familiar side to us is the physical part and it's one part of the learning environment. And I think it's really important to understand that it's a supportive element to the learning. It's not in the center. And then there is, of course, the social aspect of learning environment. I'll explain it about it a little more. As in space or anywhere, any situation, we need some kind of learning methods to learn. Like here, I'm lecturing. This is one method. And, and that's called, <laughs> together, it's pedagogy. And I think Dina will later on lecture you much more on that. Uh, in, this, in, in this situation or space, there is uh, happening communication and retreat, uh, some movement, some stillness, as you can see. And also, uh, it's very um, important aspect how we connect to other spaces or how we are disconnected from other spaces and places. So I have to tell a little bit about our uh, objective in our, our, our comprehensive school to kind of understanding what we are aiming to in the future. But I think this is a very international thing altogether. It seems to be happening everywhere. So our pedagogy is based on the national core curriculum of Finland. But uh, during the developments in understanding how the low learning processes go, combined with these IT and ICT technologies and their progress, we have led to con considerations uh, of the pedagogy at all and, and the teacher's role in it. We don't just need today basic literacy and numeracy skills or good memory. 
but we need to learn how to do critical thinking, uh, how to use creativity, how to do you uh, do collaboration, and and what kind of communication skills we need. These are called actually four C's, twenty first century skills. So now we get to the physical learning environment. As we know, there are these architectural elements in every space that we learn. There's natural light, artificial lights. The acoustics is really important that you hear me or I can hear you. Uh, the furniture, how it's arranged. It's here, it's always the same, but in some other spaces, they are movable. The surfaces and textiles are very tactile and important and, and related to, of course, acoustics. And the indoor air is hugely important. And I have these safety, healthy and accessible. These are the kind of basic qualification in the to any educational building. They are equally important. But in the center is the user, how, how we can help the learner and teacher work in, in learning spaces. I'm going to show you kind of two basic ideas of learning space. It's, it's the traditional learning space, a little bit the, the, like this, hugely beautiful space, but still we have four walls and it's teacher orientated. So, so you can hear me well and see what I'm showing and it's informational. <clears throat> and, and the communication between learners is minimized in this situation. Then there's another kind of space. It's an adaptive learning space. And it's, it's designed for all those other kinds of methods. It's for planning and group work cooperation and independent studying, and it makes it possible to do team teaching in those spaces. Uh, this, this picture is from the quite beginning of Pero School, and, and the architects, this Arno Savel, uh, kind of showed us what he found, what kind of elements, space elements there are possible to use. And on the left side, you see the traditional spaces, classrooms, different sizes of them. And on the right side, you see adaptive spaces. And those spaces allow uh, <clears throat> special group learning or small group learning, discussion spaces, working group spaces, and independent working. I did a study about uh, some schools during the pedal school and, and I kind of studied how these spaces can be seen in, in school buildings in Finland. Her first example is from the beginning of pedal school from 1978 by Osmo Lappo, architect, who really did a lot of development in, in school architecture at that time. This building is for 480 pupils. I think it was an elementary school. This, as you can see, it's divided into three zones, A, B, and C. And it's, it's a knife for adaptability. All these space elements I was showing for general learning are present in this building. And the emphasis is on the adaptive spaces and flexibility of the sea. So these are general learning area. The spaces enable home bases for the, uh, for the classes and there are sliding and folding doors between the general learning spaces. Uh, the measurements in this building were based on modules with structuralist intentions in architecture. 
desks were already designed to enable forming groups. The spaces could be converted to create diverse types of pedagogical settings in the building. And the convertible general learning spaces may, made fluidity possible. In the B zone, you can see um, it includes traffic and facilities areas. There were few student entrances, which meant heavy student traffic inside the building. At that time, the hallways were not considered to be good places for independent studying. The inner student traffic concentrated in the hallways, which generated, of course, noise. The A zone comprised of subject teaching spaces, lunch area, and gym. The solution prepared for a more open and student oriented methods for the future. The classroom walls could be dismantled and the spaces could be connected to a larger central area or divided into smaller spaces as needed. So very flexible. Uh, but I have to say that many of these first attempts uh, failed because the building techniques weren't just good enough and, and the ICT technology also didn't work so well at that time. So they kind of uh, added walls to uh, these buildings afterwards because they didn't uh, function well, well enough. Second example is from the 90s. This was a, a result of a national architectural competition and it's by Kaira Lahdama Mahlamäki Architects with 414 students. Uh, this typology shows already the improved number of different types of general learning spaces, which were really working. There is good amount of convertibility and fluidity in the general, general learning spaces. So they are rather, rather flexible, but still there are quite a lot of corridors and hallways. Uh, the number of student entrances has also increased. There were some complaints in this building about a lack of group workspaces, but the versatile school building stimulates the development of several types of learning enhancing practices anyways. Uh, this build, school building was the first example of learning units oriented thinking at that time. I will tell you about it later. And the third example is from 2019. It's from Helsinki, as was the, lab, the previous one. It's by AOR Architects with 800 students. So this is a big school. This was a result of an international architecture competition at that time, 2015, something like that. They seek to find a solution of the so-called new learning environments. I don't know if you had heard the term, but it was very fashionable a few years ago. The facilities had to be multifunctional, flexible and safe, while supporting interaction and a sense of community. The build building was to be divided into home units. Another objective was to create a corridor-free school. So every space would be for learning. Uh, the space structure of the building is based on six learning units, which are laid out for different learning situations, such as open spaces, classrooms, and quiet working, and small scale working spaces. Uh, thus, this building provides the students with very different types of group work and individual workspaces. Also, the lobby areas of the building provide the possibility to use small spaces inside of them. So this is the kind of flexibility that we are in Hel aiming in Helsinki. Now I'll show you a kind of a scheme, how the typologies of the space design has, has developed. Oh. Uh, in the beginning, you see the traditional, only the tra traditional learning spaces and, and the development is going towards this open plan 
building where um, it was an idea that you don't need the walls at all anymore. But um, there's been a lot of problems with these open plan learning spaces as was I was telling you about these architectural elements. It's quite hard to control, especially acoustics in these spaces. So you get kind of peaceful learning situation. So in Helsinki, we think that we need a good balance of these traditional and adaptive spaces, both. They are equally important. Uh, then I'll tell you the concept of, of our design strategy in Helsinki. We kind of think of the educational building as a city, a small city in a city. This idea is not uh, our, ours. It's it's there are some some actually some earlier school buildings that are built this way too. But kind of the concept we've been we've been um, developing the flexibility in, in in this concept. So we kind of group different actions together or functions and and put them together and create kind of a blocks inside the building. So we can we can uh, kind of make make the spaces clear for the students and, and they can learn step by step to to use the building. Firstly they use maybe one block but when, when they get older they get to use more and more more spaces. And this gives us a chance that the time and use overlap in this in these buildings. It's kind of a hybrid space program. And also it gives a chance to multi-use spaces between common spaces. And we can optimize all the informal spaces and urban spaces. The co-design process is very important in this kind of a design process. So I'll I'll tell you about these learning space units, how we combine things together. And this is this is based on, on the national na, our national core curriculum. So it's not our invention. So we have these general learning spaces, as I was sh showing you already, where you can do various various types of learning and playing. And you need to have storages also for the learning materials in these spaces too. This is uh, not a very, very good picture, but it's a it's a drawing of a one of these blocks, which which is uh, which which has various learning general learning spaces. It's approximately for one hundred and thirty students, and we have several of these blocks in the school building for different year level students. And there you can see the combination, how there are some adaptive and traditional space elements. Uh, now we've learned that there's kind of, there's two, two classrooms and smaller group work and some independent uh, study places. And then there's a common area for studying together, but uh, this has caused us a problem because you have to go to these classrooms rooms through through that space. So it generates some noise in it and, and we, we have to develop this, this concept still. And we have developed this concept further. And for general learning spaces, here's a, one example of auditorium how they can be used still. We don't have them in our space program. The architects very, <laughs> very inventionally create places for this inside the building by the stairs. And here in this inside, you can see that the walls are not even always necessary if you can design, design it well. You can see that there is some people doing group work so it, it can be used <clears throat> students actually like this doing their homework in these spaces then there are subject teaching spaces which uh, 
in Finland, they, they uh, consist labs and gym and spaces for skills and workshops. Uh, this is an uh, uh, idea of a lab area where you can study physics, chemistry and domestic science and, and you can uh, design it as a block where you have kind of a, you can have a, a separate lab so groups of students can use it, use it uh, flexibly and then there's a design and learning area where people can gather and then you can possibly get an assignment and then you can decide where to do it. And, and we have actually domestic science very often in this area too. Just one, one example of labs from Netherlands. Then there are spaces for skills. We do the same thinking in those, those spaces. We kind of group them together and the team teaching gives you a lot of possibilities in these materials and uh, we call this multi-material working that you possibly get first an assignment and then you can design if you want it to do it with soft materials, textiles or something like that or maybe you can do some technical crafts so you can decide for yourself the student can and this is showing some example how to do it. But of course, the technical workshop, they create a lot of noise. So you have to always think about the noise thing in those spaces. Then there are common spaces, dining, toilets, entrance spaces, and stairs and spaces in between. The dining, dining is important in Finland. We, the students get free meal in Finland, so so it's kind of a very, very uh, big concern how how we can feed all the all the students in approximately three hours in a building. So it's 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 important how you design it. But nowadays we use it also for teaching and learning in in outside the dining hours. And here, of course. I think this is also, you, I, I must say that the noise, noise thing is very important. It's very nice to have an idea, to have a big hall for dining, but that generates so much noise through the building. So usually we end up doing it as a one floor solution. Then there are these kind of places in between where, which are equally important to have places for retreat and independent working. Uh, we have to always keep in mind that we design them so that these spaces are controllable somehow, that uh, there's not bullying in these spaces or anywhere in the school buildings. And then you have the opportunity also, you have these spaces in between, how you can use them in the design. This can be some of the spaces that students like most. Then there's the schoolyard. It's, it's very important for learning. We, we really think so. And, and the playing and learning are, are are really, really important for the learners and for their health also. Here are some examples how you can, what kind of function you can put into the schoolyard. There are, nowadays they are really full of, of stuff. And of course you have to have administration for the teachers and other personnel. There are multi-space offices, meeting and lunch rooms, staff social spaces, and student welfare. Like here's an example from Netherlands that staff room can be like a cafe and, and maybe I think it, it would be nice that student could go by that space and, and see the 
teachers and ask for them, but of course they need some privacy also. And here you have an mm -hmm. example of, of a teacher working space. Why yeah. is there that you know, green container? Is that good? Oh, good question. I don't know. <laughs> I think there's something, some personal space inside of it. I can't remember. In the end, I will show you how it's done in, in Helsinki. One example. This is a Puotila Elementary School uh, with 600 students. And I was in this process with uh, Verstas Architects who designed who did the design, building design. <clears throat> and it was also a very strong co-design process with the users. The school is located in Fuotila. It's by, by a metro station if you want to go to see it. It's quite easy. And um, there used to be an old school building, I think from the 60s maybe, but uh, it was in a really bad condition and they, they had a lot of inner air problems in the building. So it was decided to demolish the buildings. And I think the parents and, and local people were really relieved that they get a new school building there. In some cases we don't, we just renovate. I think we renovate more than build new buildings, but this, this it just had to be demolished this building. Here you can see it from the outside. Just wanted to show you that the scaling is really important, of course, in school buildings. That it's it's the architecture is is reachable and not scary. And also the suitable learning uh, building materials. This is made of wood, so so it's it's. I think the, it's it relates to acoustics and and, and the tech. It just feels kind of nice for the children. Here are the floor plans. Um, I just showed you the general learning spaces of the schools, and here you can see the blocks how they are situated in the building. In the first floor there are two blocks these are for the uh, smaller children so are they, they are close to the schoolyard it's easy to get out and do some learning outside and on the second floor there are four blocks and they are situated also so that you can do kind of cooperation between the blocks so it's nice if you can do some 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 working with different age students. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but there are a lot of these small group group spaces. Uh, there are over twenty languages they are studying in this building. So these small spaces are really good good for them. The the language teachers come from everywhere from Helsinki to teach. So it's it's very easy for them to find these spaces where they find the, their students. So we try to get a preschool now to every school in Helsinki at least. Mm -hmm. And here are some learning spaces inside the building. So you can see there's quite traditional classrooms and but also these other adaptive types of spaces. Then subject teaching spaces, you can see here, there's a block for arts and crafts and music and gym. Music and gym play quite quite well together because there's sta a stage between them and you can use it for music teaching also. Here you can see the common spaces, the dining and a communal space. And you kind of have these learner steps also, as you can see. And here are the administration spaces. In the downstairs, you have the dressing rooms and upstairs, there's student welfare and staff spaces. But one of the ideas is that you can use this building also outside the school hours. 
and it's the hybrid use and this shows all the blocks that can be used outside of the school hours and there are entrances so that you can you don't have to go through the building you can always go to this one block and of course the schoolyard you can use it anytime and and i see i see a lot of children there outside the school hours hey if you remember one thing remember that we design for the users <laughs> thank you so there was a question of okay. bullying and bullying, bullying at school. So can we prevent it somehow? Yeah, yeah. I said yes. The design is very important. We we can do a lot in it. So we we design the schoolyard so that there are not any spaces behind other other buildings or or uh, yeah, the toilets. We design them that they are by one user. We don't have a kind of toilet building somewhere behind that you can bully somebody there. So it's actually a really big part of our uh, yeah, so designing. So the question was about uh, size of the space versus like size of, of a child. So so if, if uh, there is a small child, so how, how he feels the space or, yeah. Yeah, the scaling is very, important but we have to remember that there are always adults with children so it has to work for both of them at the same time but it's it's really important to think about that and it, it relates to bullying also so the question was uh, to hear more about the co-creation process uh, so are the users uh, the pupils and and staff and and the city of helsinki so, yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, the design process is very important for us. And, and uh, we design with the personnel very much uh, during the process. And, and we give kind of areas for the students to do some parts of the building, maybe in the yard, school yard, something, or, or inside in the common spaces, something some some place but it's always when the building is ready the students are already out of probably of that building but but we want to keep them of course with us and, and work work with us but does it happen that the the users who are involved in the design phase they change yeah. by the time when the building is finished so yes. so have you faced any problems in that 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 there are different needs and different opinions and and maybe the end users are are a totally different opinion than than the those one who were in the design process yeah. that, that's where we have a kind of a Helsinki strategy design book that we kind of use this for every every building and then we can discuss a lot of things, but but we keep in mind that the person might change. There might be another person thinking otherwise. So it has to work for that person too. So the design manual is very important in a city like Helsinki. Maybe it's different in, in small communities. Can you tell more about the participative process? So do you arrange workshops with the with the users the teachers or or and the children or how do you do that yeah we have we have uh, like uh for a building process uh over 20 meetings with the users throughout the process so we we get to know them really well and and when the building is finished, we just want to make that sure that everything is, they are pleased with the spaces and, and we interview them so we can learn <coughs> to do things better. So are the results of these, uh, these processes publicly available? Uh, not really. We have the decisions, they are public, of course, but, but not, not so much we just don't have resources for that, actually. 
but uh, nowadays we are starting work, working with Tina, who will lecture you later. We are doing a, a kind of a uh, research, research on school buildings that maybe we can open up a little bit about these things in it, hopefully. So the question was about curriculum changes, when it changes uh, every 10 years or, or so. So uh, can we foresee future? So. Yeah, it's it's very interesting question. In my, I showed you my research, and and uh, what surprised us was that the seventies curriculum was actually very similar to the curriculum right now. So actually, it hasn't changed that much. But I think we are just learning more and more to do it better. So that's how the buildings have also developed through the years. Uh, percentage how much you use the spaces or or oh, that's quite high in Helsinki yeah. yeah it's the politics who decide who how much money money we can use on school buildings so we kind of have to live with that but uh, the strategy of, of Helsinki is that we should use more and more outside spaces as what I was telling you in the beginning uh, like go into the city and go into the museums and theaters and learn, use those spaces for learning as well, because they are mostly city spaces uh, or the city owned spaces. So, but it's, it's, a, challenge. it's a design challenge. <laughs> so the question was about school size. So they are getting bigger and bigger in Finland. So what's the argument for that? Is it only the cost efficiency? Uh, it's one part of it, of course, but it's also this how how, how we can uh, learn how to use spaces well without the building seeming big. It's it's a this is again a question of design. Uh, Helsinki has decided that the maximum uh, school size is nine hundred students, so that we don't go further than that. With this uh, kind of um, learning units or blocks, you can make a building seem a lot smaller than it actually is. Like for those little children, they use only those two blocks and go dining and go outside. And that's all they actually see. So, so it's a question of design. So what are the needs the users usually ask? And are there something that you can't design? Uh, well, we try to try to always uh, design design as they wish, and their teachers are really professional in Finland. So I, I highly respect them. They have so much better ideas than we do sometimes. So, so we really, really, the co-design process is not just a word for us. So we really are working together. But I can kind of point out. Uh, very typical question. It could be about anything, actually. More questions? I have one. Uh, you you had one slide where you had these skills uh, like a four times C, like yeah. some kind of a critical thinking and and collaboration, or I don't remember what were all those. But then there has been this recent, um, recent like a. PISA reports that show that that uh, Finnish uh, uh, school children's skills have uh, decreased and and it has been much discussed. So, is it because of these open open learning environments and and so that they don't learn how to how to uh, write and read and do, uh, mathematics etc. like a traditional like a subjects but uh, but so so is it uh, what, what's your opinion so is it has it gone too far uh towards that kind of like a um certain skills which are not uh, not giving like the basic knowledge on on the world i don't think i'm i'm actually yeah. a right person to answer that but i'm just questioning uh the pisa test that is it is it really telling how, how we can teach these four C skills to yeah. children. It's it's kind of a 
based on, on the literacy and numeracy skills. But I think they, as the spaces, traditional and adaptive spaces, I think they are equally important to kind of know how to count and read. But it's also very important to know when you go to study to university that you can kind of self-regulate yourself and do independent working. So you're not used to that till you do like a stuff by teacher, teacher or center yeah. Yeah. learning. If you don't have uh, good enough spaces for learning, it certainly makes students uneasy. So the question was about after school uh, program. So for first and second grade uh, students have possibility to stay at school, but how about then older? And do you have spaces for after school? Yeah, I I, I think so that they have. I'm, I'm not really expert on that either, but uh, we designed the spaces so that they can anyways use use those spaces after school hours if needed. So it's it's possible. So the question was about combining preschool to to uh, comprehensive schools, and is there a social aspect in that? Yeah, yeah. The preschoolers kind of learn how to be in the school and learn how to use the building and see bigger children. So it's it's not so scary to start the school. So the best design process in your. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's it's Portilla because actually I learned myself so much from it. It's kind of opened up my eyes in many ways. Um, um, so what was the resistance of the teachers towards those like a uh, uh, spatial solutions? Yes, or? yes, they were scared of the open plant solution. They were kind of didn't know how we do it, so they were really scared that they have a one big open hallway where they have to teach it everything. So how do you take in consideration the kids with special needs, especially in open learning environments? Yeah, that's that's very important for us. And it seems like the special need children are more and more every year. So I think uh, just this adaptable little learning spaces, group workspaces, we use them for, for special need, need students. So we saw it like that. And I think we've done good solution that it's it's really working. I have one question uh, related to the Osmo Lappos. Uh, if you show the plan, that was quite like a, uh, seemed quite contemporary actually, so it was from 1970s. Uh, is it this one? Yes. yes. Yes, I was just wondering uh, when there is quite deep the the building volume. So so how do they get natural light to those spaces here? In the middle. Yeah, here. yeah good question. Are there roof lights? I think there has been this. Sadly, this building has been de demolished. So yeah, but it's published in in the. In his architectural magazine, so maybe that could give some hint. Yeah, I think there has to be some roof windows. Yeah. So, what's the meaning of the green color fluidity in this plan? Yeah, it's it means that you can use the space in many ways. You can put their different stuff in for the gym, gym uh, uh, teaching and and do kind of different sports types. And also you can arrange this restaurant or the lunch area in many ways. So that means that, but you don't change the uh, walls in it, around it. It's the same space, but you can kind of uh, refurbish it many ways. So do you base uh, design solutions to scientific research or or, or is it just that uh, we know that this work. <laughs> yeah, there there is much more research on pedagogy mm -hmm. than on the spaces. So we need a lot more research for the spaces. So, but we have some, we can base on some things, but a lot of them kind of come from learning by doing. 
still, but we would need more research, definitely. Are there more questions? No, it's a good possibility when we have a professional here. It's just a combination of these spaces in one block, and you can de decide by the block what 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 of these spaces you put there together. But it, it uh, usually in Helsinki we have a couple of these intensive learning basic group. It's basically the classic classroom combined to with some special group learning spaces. And then, then they can be combined. These can be even combined. Then you get the social common space learning space also. So it's kind of a flexible flexible combination of these spaces. Auditorium, not so much, but, but other spaces from here. So how do you solve natural light in the middle of the building? It's quite, this is quite deep, the building, and, and you have spaces in the middle that don't get natural light, light but we solved it so that they get natural light from the roof to that space. Uh, uh, ceiling. Ceiling windows. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But here's a here's somehow here's a fo photo of that space. You get natural light from there. I don't know if it's a regulation, but we kind of in, in our city we take care of that, that there is enough natural light in any situation. Okay, if we don't have more questions, then we thank you, Sari. Thank you. Thank you.